until you experience the unbelievable efficiency of it, once you get your head around it, you know, and there's the learning curve like everything else in the world, you have to think a little differently, but once you get your head around it, the efficiency is just, it's indescribable, you know, how much you can get done in a short period of time and use that solid model geometry to program machines and on and on and on and on and on. It's just, it's just a remarkable, remarkable thing. A quick interruption to mind you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Hey, it's Ari Santiago, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Made in America podcast. I'm really happy today. I have John Mendocino, owner of Ramdi Corporation on. John, thank you so much for coming on today. You're welcome. Well, listen, it's the Made in America podcast, John. So we start off with the same two questions. What do you make and why do you make it? We make several difficult widgets for a broad base industry, medical, aerospace, uh, automotive, blah, 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 you know, and it's stuff, it's not commercial work, it's difficult, relatively short run stuff, you know, we, our bag is, you know, 25 to 200 parts is our sweet spot, you know, and we always find out that when the customer puts an extra decimal place on for, for precision, that's when they stop telling us we're too expensive <laughs> because we get it done. You know, when you have this, you know, looser tolerance stuff, I'm told dozens of times a month, you guys are crazy. You want way too much for that. You know, and I said, well, that's not our bag. We do difficult, tight tolerance, fussy stuff. People have rejected parts because they have fingerprints on them. Really? Yeah. So it's 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 a different world. That's our guys, where the medical aerospace. Yeah, our, our guys live in that world. They've been trained for that world. They're acclimated to it, and they like that kind of work. Sure. You know, when they have to do the crude commercial stuff, they don't. They just don't like it. You know, so it's a, that's what we and it's a broad based telecom stuff we make. It's a lot of a lot of different stuff. And so that's the what super interesting, which we'll get a lot to that. But how about the why, John? Why? I I do it because when I was. 17, 18, a good friend of mine, he, we were drag racers. And his father bought a couple manual machines, had them in his cellar, and we used to make our own stuff in this, and, that, and I just loved making stuff. And this little machine shop in Harrington in 1970, 1978, I guess it was, was for sale. And so we went and looked at it, and both of our father signed $15,000 notes so we could buy this little machine shop that these guys were retiring from in Harwinton. And one thing led to another, and that was the endless track of doing this stuff. Yeah. What were you guys drag racing? He had an old 66 Chevy 2 Nova. You know, <laughs> it was one of those old-fashioned drag cars with the straight axle in it. They used to pull the front wheels way up. <laughs> Is that right? Wall. Yeah, it was, that's the way things were done back then. You know, it's a different animal today. So, you know, racing is a, is a, a love of mine I'd love to do, but it's just gotten priced itself out of reality nowadays. And when you have to do it with a sponsor, it's a job. It's a job, yeah, yeah so exactly. It's, it's a, a yeah, you're, but, not, you're not making pieces yeah, for your car in the yeah. basement uh, with the manual yeah. machine anymore. But then that's how we got involved with it, making widgets for the race car. And one thing led to another, and buying a small machine shop and doing other things in one step after the other. You know, one step so, after the other, bing, yeah. bang, boom. And I got out of it for about 15 years and consulted. You know, you? I was designing special machinery for you know the plating industry primarily, helping guys build that stuff. I actually the, the last two plating shops in Connecticut designed are in my computer. I designed all, all the floor plans, how to get all the drainage out of them if there was a spill, all this stuff. So we were consulting for years and years and years, and then this came along. You know, and do you feel like do you feel like what you did initially was it the was it the cars that kind of gave you the passion? Was it the cars that opened the door to the machinery and then you got in there and it was making something? Like, what? I mean, you've been doing this for a few moons. A long time. Yeah, yeah. about like a it, minute or two. The, the cars introduced you to making stuff and mm -hmm. it just it just came out of me. You know, I one of the shops I had when I was in Waterbury for 13 years, there was a, a guy old enough to be my father that was a partner in it at one time. But he used to come in, because I always work seven days a week, and he used to come in there on Sundays when I was actually doing the hands-on stuff. And he would sit there in a stool in, our, in my tool room, and he would watch me make stuff. It's just, 
I was lucky enough at a young age to find something that just came out of me. You know, mm-hmm. it was just, now I'm a bean counter, and I don't like it. There's <laughs> nothing better than when something breaks, and I get to get in there and fix it now. But he used to watch me, and he, he was always fascinating. I remember te- him telling other people, they say, you got to watch this kid work. It's just, it's fluid. It just comes out of you. And, so, and I think anybody that has something that they're just naturally good at, it, they just tend to do more and more of it. And musicians the same way, you know, so on and so forth. So, yeah, 100%. He's it's, very fortunate. When you can find find that thing, right? That and in thousands of people have asked me, literally thousands over the years, they say, you know, you're lucky you got something that you just love to do. Because I, I don't go to work, even when things were terrible. You're not going to work. This is just doing battle every day. It's it's good sport. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then that's interesting. So you, you find this thing that comes out of you, obviously extremely talented at it. But then you went into consulting. So what was that all about? Well, we made a, a horrible, horrible deal with Torrington Company in the late 80s. Okay. And I was in my late 20s, early, just late 20s. And we watched a million plus dollars evaporate over about a year. And so we got out while we still had a little bit of hide left. I mean, that a million dollars 30 years ago isn't what a million dollars is today. A and a million dollars is, today is still... It's still a fair chunk of money, yeah, but yeah. back then it was a lot of money to burn through. So so we got out of it, and I didn't know what to do, So, but I had made a million contacts. I knew a lot of people. So I started designing special tooling and special machinery and this and that, and it, I stayed involved with the manufacturing world You know, up to here. I was always ended up to here. And one thing led to another, and it's uh, then the Ramdi thing came along. And I was... I was actually recruited to teach SolidWorks over in Middletown for a while because I made the transition to solid modeling software in 1998, long time ago. It's There's still a lot of people that haven't. That is know. true. So I made that transition over 30 years, oh, 23, 24 years ago. And I was good at it. So the, the dealer actually recruited me to do training for them because they had a hard time finding somebody. And I taught for them a couple, three days a week, you know, four-hour sessions, five-hour sessions every week for a couple of years. And it was they, they were kind of forced financially to find somebody else because I wanted too much money to do it. Mm-hmm. You know? I said, I can't come here for half of what I can make staying at home <laughs> designing. It's just not going to happen. You know? Right, right, right. So we did it for a couple of years. But I made some other contacts while I was teaching, you know, and that turned into – these guys asking me, because they knew my story, because I used to take them out to lunch to students and stuff. And they asked, and they said, well, where can we get this made? Where can we get this made? And I knew exactly where to get it made, because I've been in it. So I was having Ramdy make the stuff. And even a lot of the stuff they didn't want to tackle, because it's nightmare stuff to make, I went in there and I helped them work through process, you know, to get it done. So I was a middleman for a long time. And I it's could more s- than a middleman. You're, yeah. the, you're the middleman connecting. Yeah. Then you're the process engineer, the QA yeah. guy. Yeah. I mean, it's, you, so it's, it's a little, I, little more than a middleman. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, but I could see the last couple of years, the place was circling the drain. The service was going away. It was getting more and more difficult for them to deal with. And uh, the owner asked me, he says, would you entertain the idea of coming in here full time to try to straighten it out? He says, if you can fix it, I'll give you 25% of the company for nothing. So I, I was looking at it and saying to myself, I really don't want to go back into this. But if I don't, I'm going to lose my source for getting all this difficult to do stuff done. So I was stuck between a rock and a hard place. So I went in and did it. And he questioned a lot of judgment calls early on. And I said, it's on me if it doesn't work. So he... Uh, the first year I was, I went in in March of, we bought it in 14, so it was beginning of April 2012. I went in there, decided to tackle it. And 2012, 2012 is the come on in. Come on if in. If you make it work, 25%, 25 for your effort. Percent. Hold on. And before, I, I the, listen, for the audience that's going to pick this up, we have a lot to talk about on the Ramdi kind of take over, rebuild, retool. Mm-hmm. I, before we get to that, I just want to ask a couple quick things before we get off some of the other stuff. Two uh, things that, that are really interesting people could learn from. First one is, what did you see in solid modeling and in solid work so early on? Like what, because you know, I think it'd be interesting for people that haven't got there, they should hear this. But, but also maybe there's a nugget here of how to look at the next technology, you know? It's until you experience the unbelievable efficiency of it. Once you get your head around it, 
you know, and there's the learning curve like everything else in the world. You have to think a little differently, but once you get your head around it, the efficiency is just, it's indescribable, you know, how much you can get done in a short period of time and use that solid model geometry to program machines and on and on and on and on and on. And it's, just, it's just a remarkable, remarkable thing. And I was using CAD key before, that, <laughs> okay? And I was trying to, because they were early on trying to be able to make solid models internally in their software. And two or three times over about a four-month period, I had a l hundreds and hundreds of hours into some engineering projects. And something failed in the software, and I lost all that work. <gasps> so I went to the dealer, who at the time was Unitech over in Middletown. And they were my CAD key dealer. And I knew they were starting to sell SolidWorks. So I went over there, and I was livid. I said, I lost another project today. I said, I got three weeks in this thing, and it's all corrupt. It's no good. And the problem with um, software that automatically backs up, it backed up a junk file. So the backup mm -hmm. copy was no good. Mm -hmm. you know, that's why I always argue about the RAID mentality in servers. It's just making duplicate copies of junk. What good mm -hmm. is it all? So mm -hmm. anyway, I went over there, and they showed me SolidWorks. They sat me down with it, gave me a quick demo. I pulled out a credit card, and I left with it. Is that right? And they said I was the only customer that ever did that. <laughs> you know? And that's when they, a couple years later, they recruited me to teach and all this stuff. Have you always been passionate about new technology? Always. I mean. Always. Yeah. Not so much computer stuff, but widgets involved with making stuff. We, we have a new machine coming in November that should be over the top. You know, this thing is going to be a cool, cool toy. And I can't wait for it to come in. You know, it's, uh, we keep moving forward, moving forward like that. But no, I made that transition. If people don't understand the power of solid modeling, they really need to spend some time with some people that have really embraced it. You know, like I did 23, 24 years ago almost. You know, it never, never looked back. You know. And I mean, how important have you seen from your individual career, mm -hmm. from the consulting and the teaching you've did, mm -hmm. how important have you seen it be to be leaning into that new technology and always looking for the next thing? You, if you don't do it, it's adapt or die. You know, and it's a simple thing. It's, you know, if you don't move forward, then the guy down the street is going to, and you be, and today you become a dinosaur in five years, never <laughs> mind 10 or 20 or 30 like it used to take. You know, and if you don't do it and you don't embrace it, you don't enjoy it, you better find another way to make a living. You know, it's, it's, it's no different than people trying to do this with 15-year-old, you know, you know. Recording you equipment? Know, five computers, you know, if you try to do that. You know, so... That's just I, I yeah I appreciate you kind of going circling back to that John because it's just to me I think number one people think it's new oh like oh the last ten years this yeah. stuff's been around for a long yeah. time and I yeah. think one of the things that has changed and you touched on it right there is you used to be able to get away with being slow because mm -hmm. maybe it was a ten year run maybe a fifteen year run mm -hmm. but man it is like. If you're not moving, five years later, it's too late to catch it's up. It's exhausting just trying to figure out what you missed. Yeah. Never mind that you actually missed it. You know, it's crazy. <clears throat> even the hardware for these machines, I've always bought very, you know, five thousand dollar workstations or even more expensive than that. I paid five thousand dollars for workstations twenty plus years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, and they've maintained that price, but they're just wildly more fast. Unbelievable. Yes. But you know, these things in reality are only good for two, three, four years. You know, yes. four years, you best, you know, pony up and get another one or you're done. You know? Yeah. And the leverage that you can get by having the right tech. Anyway, all right, perfect. I love that. Wonderful. So cool. One last thing you mentioned before is you talked about this like example in Torrington where you guys kind of almost went to zero mm -hmm. and had some mm -hmm. stuff. You know, I think um, you're, we're going to talk about sort of the RAMD and the recovery there. Here's an example of something that you got out because you, you couldn't turn it around. I wonder if maybe you could share some broad lessons you learned from that experience or, or what you saw there. And It was back in the days when manufacturers, big, big manufacturers, the touring companies and larger, they decided the MBAs were going to run their railroads, no longer the shop rats mm -hmm. like I am. So they started hiring all these MBAs. I took, I, and I took on this large project from Torrington Special Products. You used to have three big plants in the area. I found a perfect building to do it, centrally located to everything they did, on and on and on. And when I took it on, we, the deal was pretty much a handshake. You know, 
And because I hate people that ask for non-disclosures. I hate people that need a big 20-page thing to sign because I look at it like they don't trust me because they know they can't be trusted. Mm -hmm. If I can't do it on a handshake, I run for the hills because I look at the other guys saying he's the first one to screw somebody. Mm -hmm. You know. So, But I made this deal with Tony Company on a handshake. Their MBA started running the railroad, dictating policy, blah, 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 blah. And it just turned into an absolute disaster. You know, and so and it, what made it even worse, the pouring you know vinegar into the wound, the salt in the wound was, after I closed my place, they had taken the, the this huge project that I took on for them that I guaranteed them we would deliver on time, blah blah blah. I found out because I happened to know the three guys. They split that work up, and they were paying those guys as some of them four times. Most of it they were paying three times to those guys that they were paying me. And when I tried to salvage it. I went in there and said, listen, you know, we agreed to do this for what your th- theoretical in-house cost was, and it's not enough to float the boat. I said, we really need to double those prices, and the, guy, the MBA guy said no. But so when we closed, they ended up paying three and four times in a lot of cases. So it's, whereas 10 years earlier than that, the guys that ran these plants came from the tool room. And they work their way up. And they understood it. And they would do everything they could. But the MBA is just, it's, it's a line on a spreadsheet. Mm-hmm. And that's all that matters. You know? So that's, that's what caused that. It was not yeah. Good. You know? yeah, not so, good. So I, but I think there's a lesson there, right? And I oh, think, absolutely. And I think when you talk about some mm-hmm. of the new, like the Toyota production system stuff, mm-hmm. right? The sort of going to Gemba, getting into the weeds. You know, don't make the decision from the boardroom. Don't look at a spreadsheet. Someone's got to get down in the machine room and understand what's going you on and be to on the floor. understand yep. what it takes to do that, you mm-hmm. know? And I think part of why I, I've been, I was able to pull Ramdi out of the doldrums is, this is what I do. I don't, I don't have to worry about going out on the floor and a guy saying, well, this doesn't work for this reason and, and blowing smoke up. And I'd have to believe it. You right. know, I'd say, get out of the way. I'll do this myself. I don't need you. I need you to make my life simpler, but I don't have to have you to do this. So <clears throat> I think that's part of why I was successful and my partner is probably, we linked up because he's probably the best Give him a part, and he knows in two seconds exactly how it's going to be made. He's so good at what he does, it's scary. You know, great memory. Doesn't have that when I start pushing things to the edge, like this new expensive machine we're buying, he gets a little, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he's gone along, and I, and I tell Mark, I said, you know, every time we push it forward a little bit, it gets better, better and, and better. better and better. And yeah, he yeah. says, I can't argue with you. He says, it has... And things we talk about now that are problems, every once in a while i got to remind them. I said, you know, turn the clock back seven years. This wouldn't hit the radar ever. Right. The problems were so big. I said, we're talking about this <laughs> silly little stuff now. You know, how can we find – I I was looking at bills one day, and I saw the UPS charges and all these small tools that we buy. And I went into them. I said, you know, is there a way you can package and buy tooling and get – 20 or 30 orders at once, so we, we had a $40 UPS thing instead of $700 worth. Right. And we really can't do it because of the type of business we're in. We're on an on-demand type of rat race. So, But, you know, and he, he started pushing back to the back. I said, you know, it, it's weird. I said, you know, this would have never, ever, ever come up. I said, seven years ago when we were bought this, our conversations were, where are we going to find five hundred grand this year? Right. You know, to keep the hemorrhage... Get the, stop the bleeding, you know. And I said, two, three, four years later, it was a, where are we going to find fifty grand? I said, now we're looking at how can we save a thousand dollars, you know, in a year, <laughs> right, yeah, because right. all the uh, the elephant has almost been eaten completely at this point, and that's what we talk about. Those are the big problems now. Nice. All right. So let's get so let's get into the let's <laughs> so get into cool. the Ramby. So so you were back in 2012. You get the offer. So you, you you've been the uh, you call it the middleman. I say the middleman plus, but whatever. So you're in there. 20 2012, the offer comes to you, says, hey, John, if you come in here, you help us figure out how to make this thing work, I'll give you a quarter of the business uh, for your for your trouble. Yep. What happens? <clears throat> so he, he kind of, he questioned all the decisions I was making early on. Like like what? Uh, uh, guys that had to go. Uh, you know, uh, that's the gut decision. This is the bad cultural this fit. Got a, you know, a, well, Johnny, Johnny and Jane got a bounce. Oh, Johnny's been here forever and ever. Jane's key. Okay, got it. And every one of them, he says, oh, are you going to do his job if it, you know, I said... 
You don't do anything. You got to go. <laughs> and this was every three or four weeks, it was somebody else out the door, out the door, out the door, out the door. So this, this was survival. Not that you enjoy putting somebody out of work, but if I don't, there's going to be, at that point, there's going to be 37 people out of work in a short period of time if this isn't done. Right. So better a dozen than 35. So, That's right. Um, so I went and did that, and in, when we filed taxes in 2013, it was the first time a tax return had a black number in six years. There had been five years in a row of red numbers, and they were, you know, this, this was millions a year being vaporized. So it had a black number. So all of a sudden, the old owner, he kind of was relieved. He says, you know, my baby, it still has a pulse. It's <laughs> not dead, you right. know. But he started coming in, and he started dictating policy again. Uh-oh. And he, he came to me about four or five, six months later. This was late. This was maybe September, October of 13, after I was there about a year and a half. And he says, he went in, he said, closed the door. And I, went, I sat down, he says, you have no energy anymore. You have no direction. You know this, know that. And I said, Alan, I said, everything that we got moving down, stream nice and smooth you've completely turned it upside down again in three or four months i said what do you want me to do so he decided he comes in one day and he announces that he's going to sell his house in the cape and come back here and stay full time because he used to come in he used to leave the cape first thing monday morning show up late middle afternoon early afternoon and then he'd leave about 10 o'clock thursday morning so he's there three days a week and he said, i'm selling the house on the cape coming back here and gonna run the place full time and i was like oh yeah 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 so oh, anyway, myself, my partner, we decided, well, maybe... Was Mark already working there at the time? Mark worked there a couple of years before me. He was recruited to try to fix the place. His third day there, there was a rejection that came back from a customer in North Carolina. It was close to 200000 bucks where the stuff came back. And the owner came, slammed his fist on it. He says, I hired you to fix this place. And he says, I've been here three days. <laughs> it, took <laughs> so left it took more than three days to get here. You know? And so... Uh, I got to know Mark, and it was interesting when I was there with Mark, working side by side with Mark every day. We worked were long weeks side by side, and he would tell me all these stories about the place. And I, in my mind, I'm saying this is a disgruntled, grumpy person. You know, there's no way this could be this bad. But after two, three, four, five months, I started seeing. It. I said, he he nailed this. He, he there was no nonsense about what he's. This place is really that bad. <laughs> it was unbelievable. So we became good working partners together you know and when the owner decided he was going to come back and run the place full time i said you know why don't we take because one of the other customers followed my partner mark there when he came there they were sending the work there because mark was there there, right so i said why don't we think about we'll buy a couple machines we'll look you'll find a building i said we'll just start from scratch i'll take all the work that i bring in here anyway we'll take the customer that followed you in here and we'll just start from scratch so that's the approach we were taking. And one day my, my wife, which I have to commend her for the suggestion, she says, why don't you just buy them out? And I said, he's not going to sell. This is, this is almost a 30-year-old company at this point. It's got a pulse again. He's not going to go. And so after weeks and weeks and weeks, she said, one morning, Monday morning I went in and I emailed Alan. And I said, if I can do A, B, C, and D, will you just go away? And he said, well, and I called him and told him, he said, can you email me that? So I emailed him that offer. And he called maybe an hour later. He talked to his wife. He says, you mind if I run it by the account? And I said, knock yourself out. So he called about an hour after that. And he says, you really think you can make that happen? And I said, I, I, I'll make it happen. And he says, do it. I'm not coming back. And he never came back again. That was it? <laughs> no, so that was it. You know, he wanted out that bad, I guess, because it was a mess. You know? So that's how we that, ended up. And so that was 2014. That was, uh, that was late 2013. Okay. Okay. And that's, like I said, it was late 2013, October, November, when he asked me, you got no initiative anymore. You got no vision anymore. And it's because of you. That's why. So anyway, we, um, that's what we ended up doing. And I went to the bankers, and the bankers, were, they could see that, because they were still in, on the hook for about a million four at that point. And they looked at it, and this is, I was telling you when you called me, you know, I'd like to really put a plug in for Thomaston Savings Bank. Because Thomaston Savings Bank. Thomaston Savings Bank. Because they, I sat with them, and I explained to them, and I said, I think I can do this, blah, blah, blah. And they, they went along with it. And the first year, they wouldn't lend us another penny. They just wanted to make sure it could survive a year. <laughs> okay? So when we showed a real decent black number after our first full year there, we bought it January 1st, 2014. 
right? And when we filed taxes, we had a real decent black number, and so they lent us the money to buy our first brand new machine. The place needed in the worst way, you know. <laughs> and it's just move forward from there. And especially, you know, there, there's how was that? I just want to ask the question because I mean, a lot of people probably listen to this podcast. I've had to deal with mm-hmm. bankers before, and mm-hmm. some successfully, and mm-hmm. probably some not so successfully. Um, and one of the things you always hear banks are always saying, mm-hmm. "Oh, we're relationship. We mm-hmm. care about our customers," but mm-hmm. a lot of times doesn't always feel like that after the deal struck. So what was your experience like? I mean, what did you say to them when you sat across the table and, you know, give me some color? Uh, Well, my partner put up a substantial chunk of cash when we did it, and it was to pay off a a CDA loan, Connecticut Development Authority loan, and the old owner had put his house up against that. So part of the deal was we pay that CDA loan off to take the encumbrance off your house on the Cape. So my partner took enough money out of his house paid that off. I put up a bunch of money in various other ways early on. <clears throat> but our bankers, in, in, like I said, they kept real tight reins on us. But they knew at one time, Ramdi was a cash register. You know? But I think what happened is the original owner, who I told a million people this story, early on, he had the nerve a lot of people didn't have. He bought more expensive equipment than most places. He wasn't bashful about buying good equipment. And he, it, it, that CNC world exploded mm-hmm. for him, okay? Mm-hmm. And he made a ton of money for eight or nine or 10 years. But when, it, when more people started doing it and more, he, he didn't know how to compete. He didn't that goes know how back to, to the technology thing we talked he, about, right? He, you make the turn, but if you don't keep going. You better keep going. And he didn't know. Well, even physically in him as an individual, he didn't know how to make that stuff work. Where yeah. I do, Mark does, yeah, blah, blah, yeah, blah. Yeah. So he didn't know how to compete. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. So anyway, that's how it ended up circled in a drain like that. Got it, got it. So our bankers, you know, the Thomas and Savings Bank, knew that that place, because they had always had the business since 1988, they knew that that place was a cash register at one point so i told him and i don't know if my story they just <laughs> were enamored by my story whatever it was but they decided to go along with it and like I said, they wouldn't lend us any more money for a year but when we they showed a real good return the first year and they, they started freeing up a little bit and now they're good they do move a little bit too slow for me when i ask for something but that's their system it, yeah, just, right. move, it just moves slowly but you know, and in particular, there's a gentleman named Mark Crook there, who he has been the backstop for us there. Because I think the bank may have just taken their lumps and lost their money and said, let it go. It's yeah, too yeah, bad. Yeah. But Mark Crook stood behind and said, I think these clowns can make this work, blah, 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 blah. And now he's our best friend. Now he's pushing us <laughs> to do a new building. You know, he's, he's, he says, I got to get you in your own new building. <laughs> said, well, you guys have made him, you guys have so made him look really good. I'm much happier now. And yeah, I'm sure there were a lot of meetings he went to where he took <laughs> a lot of flack, you know, because it was, it was ugly. You know, it was real ugly. So, I mean, you know, I know we've been talking for a while, but I just want to share, like, what did you do, you know, for anyone who's looking at their business, either saying, hey, you know, we're not where we want to be. Maybe it's not a full turnaround. Maybe it's not even a turnaround at all. Maybe it's we know we're doing okay, but we want to we want to make it even better. What are some of the lessons you learned from from Ramdi and, and what you did there to, to kind of turn that around? A, a lot of it is I'm doing stuff that I swore I would never do in a million years. You know, you be, you, you being counted. You know, and you look at every part number. Are you making any money on it? If not, you know, maybe you'll try it a second time to see if maybe your process was off, this and that. But and maybe maybe even a third time. If you get a little bit closer to second time, maybe you'll push it to third time. But at that point, if you can't make any, if you're still losing money on it, you don't see any way to get where you got to go. You got to tell the customer the price has got to be here, or send it someplace else. It's simple that we were there the first 90 days we owned Ramdi, we threw out the big two largest customers that they had. You know, we told them, we can't make any money on your stuff. They said, we're, I'm going to be an adult. We're going we're gonna to finish the purchase orders that you have on the books, but don't send another order. They said, oh, we spend a million bucks a year with you guys. I said, it's costing us a million four to do it. <laughs> I said, do me a favor. Go away. <laughs> so we threw the two largest customers out the first 90 days we had it. 
You know, and you have to do that stuff. The customer isn't always right. What when, happened with those customers? I don't know, and I don't care. Okay, so you know? so there's no no no. Listen, I think I don't know. This is really important, John, because you know so many people tell the story about oh man, I went to our biggest customer, told them we can't make money, and they came back and said oh fine fine we'll pay you. But no, that didn't happen. These yeah. guys, you said you got to go, and they went, and, they and went. it worked. Yeah, and I know. For a fact, one of the big ones from North Carolina is using a competitor of ours in Oxford Way. Right? And their guys used to call myself or Mark two, three times a week. How did you guys do this? How did you guys do that? I said, you know, tell them to take that work back. <laughs> you know, because I said, you're never going to make any money on it, ever. You know, and coming to find out, it was, it's been within the last year, they finally threw the customer out. After no kidding. Four, after three or four years of fighting with it and us telling them, tell them to go away. You're never going to make So they finally did. But, but they had intended on putting up a new building just to satisfy this new customer on the same property, a second building. And I guess they found out after about a year in that you know, we're, we're not making any money, we're not making any. They figured they would do the same battle. Let's try, 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 try. And we kept telling you, you're not going to do it. <laughs> it's not going to happen. But that's, it's, it's something you have to be able to tell a customer to go away. You know, we have had several customers say, well, you do, you know, you do 200 part numbers for us, and you know, we just can't pay this for that part number. I said, then you have to find somebody else to do it. Because if I'm going to lose money on that job and I have to make four other part numbers for you just to break even for that one, what am I doing here? Yeah. I can sleep all day and not make any money. I don't need this. <laughs> you know, but you have to be able to push back with a customer. You absolutely have to. You know? How did you backfill? You know, what, what was your sales strategy to bring in more business? Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because um, we had a, a double problem. They had, the place was such bad shape, they had let their ISO certification go. All right? So the, about halfway through the second year we had the place, I said, we're going to push and we're going to move forward and we're going to get our AS9100 certification rather, you know, over and above the ISO. So we spent, and it's when they, the salesmen come in, they say, oh, yeah, it's only going to cost you thirty five, forty thousand 40000 to get your AS certification. And I got a lot of napkins, a lot of yellow line pads that said, they, <laughs> all in. I mean, by the time we did our guys training, we cleaned the place up nice, we painted the place so it's really a nice place. We spent 375000 to get our, our AS certification. You know, it's not cheap, and it's a lot of work. But we pushed forward because we knew it needed that discipline. And our sales today are basically the same amount that it was when we bought the place, but we're doing it with 19 people rather than 37. You know, so it's the, the top line number, we're, we're finding it very difficult to find a new customer that's willing to pay for that premium work. You know, with no fingerprints and blah, 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 blah. You know, um, and that, that's a real struggle for us. You know, one of our biggest, our, actually they've become our biggest customer. They were on their way out the door because I had to ask every single customer for a stay of execution when we bought the place. I said, you know, give us a chance. Can you give us six months before you pull out? Because I was told face-to-face -face by everyone, we are actively pursuing a replacement vendor for you guys. And so I bought ourselves some time. And... Um, the third year in, we got our AS9100 certification. Last year, our biggest customer now, we did nine times with them what we did that third year we were there because that customer was looking to get out of there because mm -hmm. it was such a mess. So we, we got our act together. So now the customers that are there, they just keep spending and spending and spending because we've proven that we can, we can deliver. We, we never make any scrap. We're a, a dock to stock distributor for them. They don't even inspect our stuff anymore. It's... Uh, but growing the top line has become a real sore spot, and I, I haven't been able to find a way to do it. Not with a good customer. There's plenty of commercial work out there, but we're not going to make any money, so we're not interested in it. You know? Trying to find those, L trying to find the high-end needs. Looking and for the high-end ones, and, and a huge part of that problem is all of these big companies have, in the last 20 years, they've gone to shrink your vendor base, shrink your vendor base, shrink your vendor base, because it's so expensive to maintain them because you're supposed to audit them all and mm -hmm. all this and score them monthly and all this stuff. It's an expensive process. So all the real heavy hitters that spend the big money that aren't afraid to pay a premium for real nice work are expanding their, their, 
vendor base anymore. And I even had a, a buyer from Eaton that I had lunch with because one of our customers was in a bind and he asked me to come down. We went down. He showed me the problem they were having. Their customer from Eaton was there. We all went out to lunch and we had this conversation. I said, how do we get to do direct work for you guys? And he came right out and told me, he says, the only way you're going to get on our vendor list is you have to buy somebody that's already on there. That's crazy. You know, you, I look at it like what incentive is there for any of the current approved vendors to keep their pencil sharp and do a good job if they know they can't be thrown out because Eaton's not going to bring in a replacement. Right. They should, their vendors should know that every third or fourth year, one of you guys is going to get pushed out by a new guy that's hungry. And right. So that's where our sore spot is growing that top line has become almost impossible. You know, because of that mentality, shrunk vendor base, shrunk vendor base. You know. But if your customers are growing, you get some they, of They've that. all grown. We do a lot more with all of them than we did when we bought the place. Right. The so ones that we didn't throw out. <laughs> well, you got to keep the ones that work. So it sounds like you've come a long way, John. Yeah. You know, you got a place that was deep in the red. You turn it to the black. You went from trying to solve million dollar problems to hundreds of thousands of dollar problems mm -hmm. to tens of thousands yeah. of dollars now we're down to hundreds or thousands yeah, of dollar you're, you're, problems you're talking four digit numbers a big problem right right so yeah. so what's so uh, what's next well we're actually the bank has paperwork trying to buy another place up oh so you know, actually i dropped paperwork in there about three weeks ago and i said good for you over. i said you know it's a uh, it, we're, we're looking to move forward it's actually one of our customers that um they're so happy with the work but they're looking to get out because they're semi-geriatric like me but yeah i want to get out but i just enjoy doing this so it's uh so that's what we're looking to do and we're always i've been out with a couple of business brokers telling them to keep your eye on out for a place that's well suited for what we do here so what are you looking for what kind of place is well suited for you what i would like to find in reality is to, you know i've been in the job shop world forever you know i and i've told these brokers i said you know try to find me a place that has their own product that has a lot of machining involved with it. You know, and I, for an example, I say, guys, they make those super high-end deep-sea fishing reels. They, you know, they're beautiful. They're works of art. But there's lots of machine work involved, and it's your own, and that's what we do. We make that beautiful, pristine stuff. But it'd be nice to have your own product to do. But they're, they're hard to come by companies. They are hard. You know, it's, <laughs> that, ain't, that, ain't, that ain't easy. <clears throat> but we do have some feelers out guys looking for something specifically like that. Well, the best, yeah. best way to, fart, to try and find something you want is to start looking. Yes. So so that's really great. John, it has been awesome. It's such a great story. Uh, your passion's been this is really, really awesome. I appreciate you coming on. I'd like to uh, switch over to our rapid fire round of questions. You ready? Yeah. All right. Red Sox or Yankees? I follow no sports. No sports. All right. Some Formula One racing because it's <laughs> so technical. I love it. <laughs> there you go. Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts? Neither. Neither. I, I don't stop for coffee anymore. Look at you. Uh, <laughs> staycation or exotic destination? Working. Working. Sports car or SUV? Pickup truck. Pickup truck. <laughs> Do you have a favorite business book? You know, I've, I've had a difficult time thoroughly reading an entire book since I was a kid. You know, when I go through one, I remember every number, every this, every that. But the minutiae of a guy's life and their mentality, and I've attempted to read some of the, the business stuff, the Iacocca stuff, and, you know, Jack Walsh, those guys. Like yeah. That. But it's, uh, their stories are so different, they're not applicable to what I do every day. It's right. on, and it's on a scale you can't get your head on, <laughs> you know. So I don't enjoy, I read a zillion technical, uh, I would say literally every single day, seven days a week, I read four, five, six, seven technical article do you? you know or even a short piece about uh somebody like jack welsh you know or, or someone like that and little widgets they do and you know and elon musk is kind of an, a, an out there kind of guy to me but you know i read something not more than three four weeks ago about part of the reason for his success is because he's has no fear of failing mm -hmm. his mentality is fail and get it out of the way figure out what went wrong and move forward you know mm -hmm. don't evaluate things for your whole life because mm -hmm. you'll never get anything done so oh i like yeah, that yeah. that's a good good yeah. stuff if john if you had to do something mm -hmm. other than be the owner of ramdy and work in the manufacturing mm -hmm. it could be anything in the world mm -hmm. but it had to be something different what would you do uh I'd be in the racing engine business. <laughs> I, I love spending time in a dynamometer room. 
It's, it's just, I could, you, time just vanishes. I, I could do that full time. <laughs> when you look back on your life and career, what's something that you learned early on that you think's helped propel you to all the success that you've had? Don't worry about what anybody thinks. You know, if somebody's giving you advice, consider the source. You know, where are they speaking from? You know, I had my ex-father, I was married a couple of years ago, I was real young, you know. Um, my ex-father-in-law had been in this, so I listened to him a lot because he was in the manufacturing rat race for, he was general manufacturing, general manufacturing manager for Torrington Special Products globally, you know. So he had been in this time since he was a kid, you know. And it's, but always consider the source, you know, and that's what I learned to do early on. Mm -hmm. Thinking about what you've learned later in your life and later in your career, mm -hmm. if you could go back and talk to young John, you know, 20-year-old John, mm -hmm. and give him some piece of advice that if he'd listened to you, you think would really have a great positive uh, impact on his life, what would you tell him? Measure your risk a little more carefully. <laughs> you know, not, don't be afraid of it. You know, things implode, so be it. Move on. Turn the page. You know, you wake up, the sun's coming up tomorrow morning. Move on. Don't dwell on it, but measure your risk a little bit better. Because you know, I've had a couple situations in my life where financial disaster has imploded. You know, and it's uh, but we pick our pieces up and we move on. And you, you move know? on. Yeah. That's two pretty good lessons there, John. Thank you so much for coming on the show and spending time with me. It's really been fun a uh, chat with you, and I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by IT Direct, a Compass MSP company. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and spending some time with me today. You know, my goal is to help build a community where we can learn and grow together. Your input, feedback, and engagement is critical to making that happen. Please do comment, like, and subscribe so more and more people can hear what we're doing and join our community of growth and success. Thanks so much for tuning in. Talk to you again soon.